evening. Brother Donald's not feeling well tonight, so he's not going to be here, so we will jump right into our Bible study this evening. And we are looking at Psalm 18 this evening. Psalm 18 will be the longest psalm we have hit so far. Psalm 18 is um, 50 verses. We're going to hit all of it because it was written together. So we're going to hit hit all of Psalm 18. Uh, psalm 18, if you look up at your title, it's probably got a lengthy title. Um, this is written really when or after um, after David becomes king, after faithfully um, waiting until God gives him the throne, even though he's been a, he's been uh, called to be the king by God Himself or ordained for that, um, but he has been patient in that. He's had opportunities to kill Saul, but it doesn't take him. Um, and so obviously this is a significant moment for Israel. It's a significant moment for David. But really it's a significant moment for us too because if you'll even remember the Christmas story, the angels say, unto you in the city of David, a Savior's born. I mean, if David doesn't become king, we're still waiting a Savior. So this is a significant issue. Does that make sense? Like this is... The scriptures being fulfilled, this is the prophecies being fulfilled, uh, and ultimately it's because of moments like this that Jesus is born uh, for us. Um, another version of this uh, psalm is found in 2 Samuel chapter 22, and in Psalm 116, there's some similar uh, verses in that one as well. Um, and so I think when we read this, it's kind of interesting to, to see how he David is going to stress that God is his rock and his, his fortress, his deliverer. Um, but you've also got to remember at the same time, it is the fact that he has um, been running, fleeing from Saul, but he never calls Saul his real enemy in this, which I think is interesting. Um, he's also going to, in this psalm, uh, tell the people what God had done for them, so it's going to blend a, a personal worship and also a personal witness of all that he has seen God do, which I think those go together, right? You think about all that God's done for you, should we not also worship out of that? We think of all the good things he's done and how, how, um, how he saved us, how he's blessed us, how he's given us all the good gifts that we have, all of those things are personal stories of who we are and what has happened to us, and that should cause us to worship. And we'll see that here um, this evening. So the focus of the psalm is really on the Lord and what the Lord has done for David, um, who he will say is, you know, God's servant. And I think it also tells us what God does for us if we'll just trust and obey him. I know that's a challenge for us. Uh, sometimes, but the truths here are still, still the same. Let's read verses one through eighteen, I think. One through nineteen. All right, let's start there. I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield, and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, and I am saved from my enemies. The cords of death encompassed me, with the torrents of destruction assailed me. The cords of Sheol entangled me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord to my God. I cried for help. From his temple, he heard my voice, and my cry to him reached his ears. Then the earth reeled, excuse me, in the earth reeled and rocked. The foundations also of the mountains trembled and quaked because he was angry. Smoke went up from his nostrils and devouring fire from his mouth. Glowing coals flamed forth from him. He bowed the heavens and came down. Thick darkness was under his feet. He rode on a cherub and flew, and he came swiftly on the wings of the wind. He made darkness his covering, his canopy around him, thick clouds dark with water. Out of the brightness before him, hailstones and coals of fire broke through his clouds. 
The Lord also thundered in the heavens, and the Most High uttered his voice, hailstones and coals of fire. And he sent out his arrows and scattered them. He flashed forth lightnings and routed them. Then the channels of the sea were seen, and the foundations of the world were laid bare at your rebuke, O Lord, at the blast of the breath of your nostrils. He sent forth from on high. He took me. He drew me out of many waters. He rescued me from my strong enemy and from those who hated me, for they were too mighty for me. They confronted me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my support. He brought me out into a broad place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. Now, some of the language is kind of similar, if you remember, to, to the words of Jonah when he was uh, being sunk down to the bottom and he said the water surrounded him and, and he, was, he, he, he was about to die and he called up to the Lord who was in his temple and he heard him and, and he rescued him. So there's some similarities there. But when David here... In the first three verses, he, he says, I love you, O Lord, my strength. And he gives all these beautiful metaphors for him. He says, he's my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge. He says, my shield, my, the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. These are some great uh, metaphors for battle. Okay, Like a horn back then would have been used if you were in a war of some sort or a battle and where the fighting was the fiercest you would blow the horn for your army to know where you were so that they would gather to you and that's one of those horns you would blow when things were the worst um, fortress is where you would go to when you needed protection a deliverer was someone that would protect you from uh, bad things right like so all of these these pictures that he is giving uh, reflect the kind of life that David lived because he was a warrior, okay? And also be because before he became king, he was a man of war that was constantly at fighting. And so this is, these are personal metaphors for, for who he is, right? It's a beautiful picture for, uh, for, for who God is to him. And so David starts off by saying how, how he loves the Lord, but then he says in verses 2 and 3, kind of ways that God has shown him his personal love he's been his rock has God not been our rock has he not been our fortress and our deliverer and our God is he not also the one we take refuge in I mean these are personal pictures for David but I think they're they're just as true for all of us aren't they I mean we may not be going around by the battling people uh, but life's kind of a battle a lot of times and we still need deliverers and we still we still need refuge in our life uh, he also uses that word shield you know that's a uh, that also speaks of God's protection right um, and so these are beautiful pictures so what we see in verses 1 through 18 is God really does deliver us when we call on it he really does now the the, the perfect way he does that is when we call out for Salvation, God saves us from our sins. But he also saves us in our life, right? Now, that doesn't mean that when we get cancer, that we call for God to heal us and we get it. That's not what that means. It doesn't mean that when financially things are bad, that we just call on the name of the Lord and everything goes the way we want. That's not what it means. But it does say that God's going to deliver us in the end. He saved us from our sins. And if that's all God did, then we're blessed. But he does everything else for us, too. So God delivers us, just like he delivered David, uh, when we call on him. And that's true always, isn't it? Isn't that a good reminder for us that God really does work in our life? And he, he hears us when we're praying. He hears us when it seems like the cords of death are encompassing us. And it, and it seems as if destruction is assailing us. And it seems like the snares of death are there. Like God, God really does deliver us when we pray. That's the first beautiful picture we, we see of, of the Lord. Now let's look at, I'm going to start again with 19. I know we just ended with that, but let's read 19 through 27. He brought me out into a broad place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. The Lord dealt with me according to my righteousness According to the cleanness of my hands, he rewarded me, for I have kept the ways of the Lord, and I have not wickedly departed from my God. For all his rules were before me, and his statutes I did not put away from me. 
I was blameless before him, and I kept myself from my guilt. So the Lord has rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands in his sight. With, his, with the merciful, you show yourself merciful. With the blameless man, you show yourself blameless. With the purified, you show yourself pure. And with the crooked, you make yourself seem tortuous. For you save a humble people, but the haughty eyes you bring down. If you'll go back real quickly to verse 6, it says, In my distress I called upon the Lord. And now, in verse 19, it says, He brought me out into a broad place. That's important. That word distress means to be in a tight place or almost to be in a corner. Right? Imagine, you know, when you're backed into a corner and there's no room to move. Right? That's the picture to verse to him praying, and then in verse 19, now where is he? He's in a broad place. He went from being backed into a corner to a wide open place. It's a beautiful picture there, right? That tells us that's what God does for us. All right, sometimes it's going to feel like our, our back's against the wall and we're backed in a corner, or we're going to feel like we're suffocating sometimes. But faithfulness, which is what David has done, will ultimately end the way it's supposed to. So the kind of second picture we see is that God rewards us when slash if we obey him, right? God does reward us. David is basically laying the case here, not that he's sinless, but that he's faithful. He says, the Lord uh, dealt with me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands, he rewarded me. David's not claiming to be a, sin, a sinless person. He's just saying his heart was in the right place. Because remember, he's had two opportunities to kill Saul, and he hasn't taken either one of them. He could have taken everything into his own hand and kind of pushed everything forward. But he doesn't. David was simply faithful. He says he uses the term upright, talks about pure. Um, he says he's got clean hands, right? These are pictures he gives of himself. David was merciful to Saul and faithful to God, and God was then merciful to David. We're not saying we believe in karma, okay? But we do believe that the Bible does say you reap what you sow to an extent, right? That's an Old Testament verse, like we reap what we sow to an extent. And David is just saying, look, I've, I've, put, my, I've put my entire future and trusted the Lord to it, and because of me trusting the Lord, God has been faithful back. David was loyal to the Lord is really kind of what it means by saying blameless. And because of that, God kept his promises. Now, it's also important to remember that God keeps his promises to us no matter what. And that's good news, isn't it? That, that, that's why we, as Baptists, believe, you know, that we can't lose our salvation. Right? That's a good thing. Because if we could lose our salvation, we probably would lose it. But the Bible says that he has saved us. And it says he will keep us safe in his hands. So we need to trust in his promise to us, not our promise to him. Because we're not necessarily faithful. David here is faithful, and God has rewarded him because of that. He's just saying, not that, again, not that he's sinless, but sinless, but that he was uh, blameless in his motives. Okay? Now, let's start in verse 28 and go to verse 45, 28 to 45. For it is you who light my lamp. The Lord my God lightens my darkness. I love that. The Lord my God lightens my darkness. For by you I can run against a troop, and by my God I can leap over a wall. This God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield for all those who take refuge in him. For who is God but the Lord? And who is a rock except our God? The God who equipped me with strength and made my way blameless. He made my feet like the feet of a deer and set me secure on the heights. He trains my hands for war so that my arms can bend a bow of bronze. You had given me the shield of your salvation and your right hand supported me and your gentleness made me great. 
You gave a wide place for my steps under me, and my feet did not slip. I pursued my enemies and overtook them, and did not turn back till they were consumed. I thrust them through so that they were not able to rise. They fell under my feet. For you equipped me with strength for the battle. You made those who rise against me sink under me. You made my enemies turn their backs to me, and those who hated me I destroyed. They cried for help, but there was none to save. They cried to the Lord, but he did not answer them. I beat them fine as dust before the wind. I cast them out like the mire of the streets. You delivered me from strife with the people. You made me the head of the nations. People whom I had not known served me. As soon as they heard of me, they obeyed me. Foreigners came cringing to me. Foreigners lost heart and came trembling out of their fortresses. Um, this is kind of where it shifts a little bit. Now, if you think about this, all right, all these years that David has run from Saul, what has he been doing? He's been fighting. He even says so. He even talks about, you've strengthened my hands for this. He said, I, I can bend a bow of bronze. Well, I mean, obviously, he's not literally saying, he's saying, like, physically, I'm strong. I've been swinging a sword. I've been using the bow. I've been fighting. I've, I've been working for all this during this, this season of difficulty. So the idea here is that during the years David was running, God was equipping him for what was coming. Now, that's something we don't necessarily like to think about. But sometimes when our back is in that corner, God is strengthening us for what's coming. Right? Anybody ever had that kind of happen? You kind of went through this awful season of life. And at the time, you didn't understand, and sometimes we don't, but you were faithful, and on the back side of it, you realized what God was doing. Or, or maybe you got on the back side of it, and because of what you were able to go through, you were able to minister to somebody else. Or you were able to speak truth to someone else. Or you were able to, to grieve well when someone else was grieving, or whatever it is. Um, so the, the kind of the next principle we kind of see is this, is God provides for us when we submit to it. He provides for us. God took, took great care to prepare David to become king even while he was running from the current king, right? Think about all the times you see in the Bible how God takes a long period of time to train somebody. Think about Joseph, sold into slavery, put into prison, works his way up, and then at the very end, he gets this great opportunity to save his family. What does he say? You intended this for evil, but God intended this for good. It was probably only in that moment that it finally, he finally understood what God was doing. And sometimes it's, it's like us. How many years did, did Moses take? Forty, right? Um, Joshua took 40 years working with Moses before he became the leader. Sometimes God takes, takes his time uh, getting us to where, where he eventually wants us to be. So the lessons that David learns here during this season of life about himself and also about God helped make him the man that he was. Um, so the images in these verses show that God created him to be his, this great warrior. But even though he's a great warrior, and he was, remember, even as a young boy, he kills Goliath and steals his, or takes the Goliath sword. One of the greatest pictures, I think, you, for me, I like about David is one time when he's running from, he's running from Saul, and he doesn't even have a sword, and he goes and gets Goliath's sword to use it. I mean, so here he is, just an, an ordinary guy that goes to use a giant's sword because that's the only one he had. So just imagine a guy, like everyone else is using a little one, and he's got this one that's probably three times the size of normal men's sword, which means three times heavier, harder to use, and David's using it. I mean, he's a man of war, right? But even though he is, and he talks about pursuing them and all these other things, but then yet he also says, you did this, right? He's swinging the sword, but he's giving the Lord all the credit. That's the point. Like, so God uses things in our life to strengthen us to serve him. But even when he uses us and he strengthens us to do it, he's still the one doing it through us. And that's a good thing for us 
uh, to remember. He recognized that it was really God's gentleness that made him who he was. Not the harshness, not the battle, but the goodness of God that's created him to be the man that he is now. God still provides for us when we submit to him. Um, and that's important. David, it's because David submitted himself to the Lord and to the Lord's plan that God could trust him with the authority that he was going to give him. Does that make sense? David was faithful in the wilderness before he became the king. And that's important. Uh, Jesus kind of says it this way, you know, if to much is given, much is required, right? So we need to be faithful with a little and God will give us more. And that's not always financial, okay? Although those principles, I think, still apply. Only those of us who are under authority and submit to that authority will ultimately be given authority to exercise. So if David's saying, look, I, you've tested me for this whole generation. You trained me. You made me strong. You made me wise in battle, but you're the one that fought the fight. But then now he is king. Now we'll finish it in verse 46 <clears throat> through 50. The Lord lives, and blessed be my rock, and exalted be the God of my salvation, the God who gave me vengeance and subdued peoples under me, who rescued me from my enemies. Yes, you exalted me above those who rose against me. You delivered me from the man of violence. For this I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations, and sing to your name. Great salvation he brings to his king and shows steadfast love to, to his anointed to David and his offspring forever. Well, it's interesting that he talks about vengeance here. We got to wrestle with that a little bit because vengeance is whose? The Lord's, right? At first, it almost seems as if David's like, I, I got what they got what they deserved. Well, they did get what they deserved only because they were they were trying to thwart God's plan. So he's not really saying you know, I'm getting my vengeance. What he's really saying is the Lord's getting his. He's saying, I trusted the Lord because he could have taken vengeance two times on the king and finished it, but he didn't. He let the Lord take it for him. Um, so we don't want to look at verse 47 to make it out like we should seek vengeance. That's not what David's saying. David is saying is let's let the Lord meet that out to others. God's the righteous judge. He'll take care of those things. We just need to be faithful, trust where we are, even when our back's in the corner, and just trust that the Lord on the other side is going to put us in this broad open place. And so the last kind of principle we see here is God is glorified in us when we worship him. Um, Paul quotes verse 49 in Romans 15. That's important. I'm going to read it again. For this I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations and sing to your name. Uh, and he applied it to the Jews, praising God among the Gentiles. Um, and if we think about how Paul uses verse 49, and then we look at verse 50, great salvation he brings to his king and shows steadfast love to his anointed, to David and his offspring forever. Verse 50 is clearly not about David. Okay? 50 is about Jesus. All right? Great salvation he brings to his king. Well, David is saved in this moment. But that's not the salvation he's talking about. And, and while David is his anointed, he's not really the anointed. He shows steadfast love to his anointed. And then because he says to David and who? His offspring forever. His offspring forever goes all the way to Jesus and ultimately to us. And so this is a prophetic word that's connecting everything that he has had happen to him directly to the covenant that he made with Abraham. Right? This psalm is, is basically reminding his readers and us today that God keeps his promises. So Psalm 50, I mean, excuse me, verse 50 and Psalm 18 uh, is really uh, reminding us that everything God's ever promised will happen. That we can trust God at his word, uh, just as Abraham was told, look at, the, look at the stars, see if you can count them. That's how your descendants are going to be. And that covenant's fulfilled here when he becomes king. And ultimately, it's fulfilled when Jesus dies on the cross to offer us a salvation. So we are a part of his offspring forever. We're all in that. And so if there's no 
there's no Psalm 18, there's no Luke chapter 2 telling us the Christmas story. Uh, and there's no promise of our salvation. If this doesn't happen, we're still waiting on the Messiah to come. Uh, and so for David and I think for all of us, no matter what we're dealing with in life, let's just be reminded that God keeps his promises and he keeps his word to us. Because uh, we're not trustworthy always, are we? But he is. And that's the good news that we're reminded of, hopefully every time we gather, um, but especially around this season of life. So even Psalm 18 connects all the way to Christmas um, because the Bible's clearly connected, right? It's all, all the same story. All right, um, that's Psalm 18. Next Wednesday, we will not have regular service. We are having our live nativity scene that our students have been working on real hard. I don't know all the details about it, okay? I don't, but I know it's going to be it's going to be great. We've got live animals and you name it. They've been working really, really, really hard on that, so we want to support that. Um, also, invite people. Be a great way, an easy way to get people that don't know, that may not be connected to church at all. Say, so, hey, why don't you just get in your car, bring your kids? I would say make some hot chocolate for them, but it's liable to be 85 degrees. I don't know, but it'd be a great opportunity to invite somebody here to just. Uh, just to see something a little different. Um, and so we want to support our, our students in all the work. And the adults, too, have put, put forth a lot of work on that, too.